the war story, okay? All righty. Welcome. Uh, I can't remember which is day three or four of the crash uh, aircraft crash investigation uh, instruction here at Prescott High School. I'm going to tell you a war story today. I'm going to tell you about when I, I, Denny Peoples, was an investigating officer of a crash in England. Uh, I want you to interrupt me. I want you to ask questions if you don't understand where I'm going or if I use too many acronyms. Oh, by the way, a disclaimer up front, this crash was about 20 years ago. So I do not remember the exact names, the exact places, but I do remember the process I went through, which is the process you guys are going to go through when you do your investigation. And I'm going to tell you about uh, some of the wrong paths I got on before we actually found the real uh, reason of the crash. Uh, I've actually passed around here. Cody, can I have that? Yes, sir. I passed around a remnant, a relic, an artifact uh, from the crash. Here is a acrylic piece of glass. And where do you guys, where do you guys think this came from? The canopy. The window. Canopy, Air 5. See how it's actually curved here? Smooth, smooth, smooth on one side. And actually there is a smooth part on the inside, although most of it's cracked up. Okay. Thinking that that was like from a Cessna. A Cessna. Well, it's probably similar, although this is probably about times 10 times 100 more expensive than a Cessna. This comes from an F 15E, which is the plane that I was flying in, uh, in England at the time. This actually happened in 19, good gracious, uh, 1993. And uh, first of all, let me show you what uh, F-15E looks like. In this canopy, as far as I could tell uh, from being an investigated officer, uh, came from right in the front of the cockpit. There's, the F-15E canopy is kind of a two-piece, uh, really three-piece, two-piece canopy where the big canopy opens up, like right here. And then you actually have a windscreen in the front where the actual uh, pilot and the heads-up display is behind. And uh, I will tell you about the accident. That's kind of the visual of, of what, what started off the accident. Um, so to put some background on it, I was a captain in the Air Force. I've been in about six or seven, uh, eight years. Uh, my son Luke, who some of you guys know, is now 20 years old, has just been born. Uh, he was born on his mother's birthday. Susie, my wife's birthday is uh, September 16th. Luke was born on that birthday, and she was 29. So at his first birthday, Luke's first birthday, my wife, Susie, was 30. So we're going to have a big party, right? We celebrated this. It's going to be great. It's going to be on a Friday, actually. Her mother flew from Arizona to England to be with us. So what do you think is going to happen on that Friday that we had all this big celebration planned? Crash. Rain. <laughs> a crash and rain. First of all, it always rains in England. What is England known for? Rain and <laughs> rain and more rain. Rain and tea. But uh, what is absolutely fantastic about England is the history and the, uh, the, the you know, uniqueness of it. But it does rain. So we had had planned this birthday on uh, Friday. I was getting off around 4 in the afternoon. We are going to go to London. My son's first birthday, my, 30, my wife's 30th birthday, this great. And at noon, noon in England, I am the safety officer for the base for all these F-15s. We had, uh, I think, three squadrons, two or three squadrons. I got a phone call that says, hey, F-15 just crashed in Wales. Hmm. That is a way to burst your bubble for all the, the excitement that I'd had. So the question is, for you guys living in Arizona your entire life, First of all, there's a, uh, let's go for a picture of the world. Where is Wales? Mm, good question. Okay, there is, a, there is the world. And if you zing around it to the little bitty island off the coast of uh, Europe, that is England there. Okay, this is, this is what we call England. It's the size of the, the state of Michigan. Okay, so our state of Michigan is about the size of England, and then England is called the United Kingdom. I'm not going to get into too much history, but this one island here has three parts, basically. 
historical parts. The top part is Scotland, which, oh, by the way, my family's from Scotland. That's where golf was invented. You guys are golfers. I've been up to, to there to golf. This part is England. You refer to as the main trunk of it. But then on the left side here is called Wales. Right now, they're all together. They're all one big happy family until they get mad and split up. Just kidding. But, uh, of course, Ireland, where they've had conflict, is over here on the left. That's another whole <coughs> country right now. Uh, but so anyway, we started off that day uh, 20 years ago. At, this is, you know, London, big, big city down here, two hours north, Cambridge. And then the place that the F-15Es were at when I was playing was called RAF Lakenheath. And you can actually see that this base, this Royal Air Force base that we <coughs> technically lease from the uh, Brits to have our American Air Force base, looks like a uh, World War II base that was converted into a Cold War base. And I say that because it's a big, huge runway literally taken from a farmer and, and made in World War II, one of the leftover uh, Battle of Britain airfields, but it was converted to a Cold War airfield because look how the planes, do you, do you, there's no big huge ramp like there is at Luke Air Force Base where the planes are lined up straight in a row. Why would the planes not want to be lined up straight in a row? Because a rocket attack hit one of the planes. You're right. I mean, if you're sitting there, if you hit one plane, you're going to hit 10 if they're lined up straight in a row. So this is called dispersed housing. And they actually had revetments. We call them tab Vs. But you would taxi around these, these runways, and you put one plane in here, you put one plane in here, and you put one plane in here. So if the bad guys in the Cold War, that was Russia, would come wipe out this one plane, by the way, it'd be hard to do it because there's reinforced steels, very credible uh, shelters, and without laser-guided bombs, which they did not have in World War II, I mean, uh, Cold War, it'd be really hard to take it. But you wipe out that, so what? Guess what? Every other plane could have another entrance to go and take off and actually go and prosecute the war and defend us. So this is dispersed housing. Uh, the bottom line was uh, my planes were up here on the top part, and I took off from here many times. As a matter of fact, uh, Actually, none of these pictures are from Lake and Heath. I have them over in the other field. So the planes took off from here, and typically you would go pretend like you were flying wartime missions. You were training, okay? This is a go-to-war base. This is not a training base, but you would fly wherever in England the weather was good that day, which this day the weather was good in Wales. Wales is a very, very beautiful part of the country, very hilly, very... Um, uh, mountainous, what they call mountainous, uh, you know, uh, and then has beautiful water. Uh, matter of fact, I have a picture of a Welsh uh, uh, lake that I was flying on in my, my room. But he was flying over Wales, and they were flying low level, 500 feet, 500 miles an hour, really not 500, 480 or so miles an hour. And they're flying low levels, and they're pretending to go bomb something they might do in war. For instance, if you were going to try to stop people from having war with you, you'd probably bomb an electrical power plant. Wipe it out. Therefore, the people don't have electricity. How can they <laughs> prosecute war for, against you? So there are a lot of electrical power plants on the end of these, these are lakes, and they would go pretend like they were going to go wipe out a power plant. The thing you need to realize is that in England, they do not have an American constitution, okay? And it is a different country. And when you go to those countries, can you take the American laws and say, I'm going to live like an American in England? No. no, you can't do that in Canada or Mexico or anywhere. And so in England, you have to follow their rules. The English people are not guaranteed by their constitution the right to bear arms. That doesn't exist. You have to earn it, and you have to pay taxes to have a gun and to do things like go hunting. Okay, and so it's just a different concept. It's not right or wrong. As a matter of fact, they've been a lot, around a lot longer than us, so who's to say they're not right? But one of the ways that you want to go hunting with your buddies is you don't go buy a ranch and go shooting on it. You can't do that in England. It's not legal. But one of the ways to do it is they have ranches that you can shoot on. And so in Wales, which is very beautiful, very not as densely populated, they actually had... 
uh, uh, they don't call them ranches, farms, let's call them farms, where you would raise fowl. What's a fowl? Birds. A bird, yes. And you're a rich guy, and these are big manor houses. I mean, these are like what we would call castles. They just call them houses. Uh, and they would raise fowl, and you'd have a fowl tender, someone whose whole life is to raise game fowl so that you can sell your bird to Mr. Hetherington and let him go out and shoot it. And I mean, they sell them one or two or three at a time. How many are you going to shoot today? I think I'll shoot five. Well, guess what? You buy these five fowl and you go out with your one shot shotgun. It's only allowed to have one shot. No such thing as AK-47s over there. They don't believe in that. Uh, and oh, by the way, they have a lot less deaths than we do. Uh, but anyway, you have a one shot shotgun and you go out and do that. And, uh, and they actually hire the gamesmen to grab the, the, the bird. <laughs> you grab the bird out of the, the pen and you throw it up in the air. And then you get to go shoot your, your bird. Boom! There you go. Boom. Done. And this is, happens all over England. But it can, again, in Wales, they're doing this. And so in particular that day, yes, sir? Do they hunt deer down in... You do. You can hunt deer up generally up in Scotland, which is more remote. Yes, you can do that. Uh, they're not what we call deer. They're pretty small deer. Okay. Do they hunt with a single shot rifle, sir? I think they have some... It's really regulated. It's really like maybe they have two, two, uh, two, Bullets. what do you call them, two Rounds. chambers or whatever, yeah. Double but it's just double, but yeah, double barrel, like we would call it double, they call it different rules. It's just different rules, okay. But anyway, on this occasion, we're flying at 500 feet, 500 miles an hour, and all of a sudden, some rich guys are together, four or five guys having a weekend out, and they have shot about 15 or 20 ma ma <laughs> Millards. A Millard. We're shooting Millards. What's a Millard? Yuck. What kind is it? What do we call it? It's a Millard. Mallard. It's a Mallard duck. And they have these ducks and they grab duck number one and they take them out, throw them up, and the duck goes boom, dead. Duck number two, throw them up, boom, dead. Well guess what? By the time number 30 comes around, he knows what's going to happen to his buddies. And so they grab number 30 and they shoot it up. And that duck goes, doesn't go, go flying off. He goes Phew, like a rocket because he knows he's going to get shot. And so this buddy, this English buddy goes, gee, that's pretty challenging. Boom. The duck went up to 500 feet. At the exact same time, our F-15 came across the duck hunt at 500 feet. Okay. And the duck's blood, I picked this up. I was given this by the hunter, and he goes, this is, this, I believe I shot down, I believe I shot down your F-15. He came flying by, and I shot at the duck, and that F-15 exploded. And this is no kidding the truth, is the duck went through the front windscreen of the F-15, scared to death, he didn't get shot, there was no holes in the plane, but it just happenstance that the duck went up when the guy shot, the duck went through the F-15 and blew out the canopy of the F-15. That's kind of a bad day. And the guy on the ground thinks he shot down the F-15. Okay. And oh, by the way, there was at one time duck blood on here. Not pilot blood, but duck blood on here. And there were definitely blood, duck feathers on here. And all of a sudden, the hunters have a bunch of canopy falling down all around him because they think he shot down an F-15. And what happened, of course, was when the bird came in the F-15, the exact same time, what do you do as a pilot? Eject. Well, your pilot, your, your first most fly important thing to do as a pilot plane. is to fly the plane. So the pilot flies the plane by trying to get away from the ground. His name's Brad Roberts, I'll say his name, great guy. He pulled the stick towards him, got away from the ground, and started to climb. The bird went past Brad's left head and then ran into the back seat or the Wizzo in the back. And oh, by the way, the wizard in the back is sitting there, and guess what? There's duck guts everywhere, and blood, and feathers, and everything. And it's obvious that there had been a duck strike, and but there was lots of blood. And so the guy in the back thinks what? It's, it's, it's his pilot's blood. He goes, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm now in a single seat fighter, right? There's supposed to be two people there. So the guy in the back seat, did not know what was going on. The plane was growing up and it was 
It was flying up. The front seater was trying to fly. He was blinded, of course. Uh, the mast was, was uh, messed up. And all of a sudden, the plane's flying up and uh, going away from the, the aircraft. The back seater, what should he do? Eject. Eject. He thinks it's out of control. He thinks he's looking at blood of his buddy in the front seat. So he reaches down. His hands go up because he's, he's panicked. I mean, he, he, all the stuff in his face, he's blind. He doesn't know what's going on. So he reaches down and he ejects out of the plane. Normally, the plane is supposed to be ejected. It's called dual sequence ejection. We kind of went through that, I think, in a previous, where one, one back seater would eject out and then the front seater. And there is a rotating handle where you can actually rotate the handle and choose whether or not you're going to eject one person or two. It is standard in these fighters, these are highly trained professionals, that I trust my back seater. If you choose to eject out, things are going bad, I want you to save my life. You know, you're not going to have one person arguing, do we eject, do we not eject? No, things are going downhill, either you're going to die or you're going to eject. And so we trust each other to eject us in critical situation. So the Wizzo ejected out, and he ejected out, and he looked down, and guess what? The front seater didn't eject. Mm. Huh. And I'm telling you, the last thing you do before you take off is it's called rotating the handle. Pull it out and rotate so it's a dual sequence ejection, and for some weird situation, the front seater didn't eject. As a matter of fact, <laughs> the plane all of a sudden started to fly off. <laughs> because what happened to the front seater? He cleaned his visor. Yeah, he wiped his visor off. He goes, wow, man. And all of a sudden, now he is in a convertible F-15, single seat, flying around convertible, going 500, 400, 400 miles an hour by now. And he is the first ever convertible F-15 driver. And he flies away, and actually, he goes and lands at a airfield, emergency airfield, in in the whales, and he saves the plane. He saves the $30 million plane. He's a hero. And he got the award, Brad Roberts, got the award that year from flying and saving this emergency because nobody had ever done it before. And uh, there's actually, uh, I was not on the plane, I was not on the mission, there was actually a wingman. But I mean, your wingman's out there and you see all this stuff happening, and he followed him and went and landed. What happens to the whistle? When you eject, what happens? Parachute. Parachute? Parachute. Parachute. Try to live. I mean, look down. Make sure you're not going to hit any any trees. Now, don't land in the in the, in the uh, lakes. Make sure you don't get shot by the uh, by the uh, hunters. Okay. So the Wizzo actually came down and landed about where his ejection seat. Remember, the ejection seat goes off differently. And is and he, the Wizzo all of a sudden has his canopy. He starts walking away. And the hunters come up to him and say, I'm sure I shot down your plane. <laughs> it is really the truth. So as an investigator, I came in and had a helicopter and I landed right next to the panic canopy and the, uh, the ejection seat. I also knew that the plane, it, you know, when I was an investigator, I came looking down, where's the plane, right? There should be a smoking hole and lots of death and destruction, but it wasn't there. So actually, as an investigator, this was a great crash. The pilots lived. <laughs> there was no plane messing up three uh, you know, English homes and killing people on the ground. And this guy came and landed. The thing we had to investigate was why did both injections not happen at the same time? Why do you think? That's exactly right. It's sort of spring-loaded. You pull it out and turn it, and it's, it's, it's sitting. And we, we did a lot of metal study. We had a metal expert. We sat there and studied, because you could actually go to the, the end of the plane and, and see the handle. And the reality is when you pulled it out and turned it, it was spring-loaded. And our finding, our finding was that when the, the, the Wizzo had his hands here and the bird hit and he flopped up like this and he actually hit the, the handle and it went vertical and snapped back in. So in the quick thing, it went like this and then ejected. It was single seat ejection, which rarely, rarely ever happens. You never eject just by yourself and leave the other guy in the plane. But in this case, it was fortuitous. It was lucky that it actually happened because it saved $30 million, and again, this one guy, Brad Roberts, was able to fly and land 
and uh, save the plane. The backseater uh, was not injured. I think he did have some, uh, maybe some compressed vertebrae, okay? He did the right thing. He thought he was out of control. Nobody faulted him or the pilot, and it was kind of a real happenstance thing. The rest of the story is the people on the ground that actually uh, you know, thought that they shot down the plane, he came out to my Air Force base and I gave him a tour. He was a you know, very affluent English man who liked to go hunting a lot. He shot a lot. He really, he believed he's come over to America and do, do that. hunts over here. He loves it. And, but again, his point was he thought he shot down the plane. No, no bullets, no nothing in it, but it's uh, like the only English guy to uh, do it. Our recommendations, <laughs> our findings, our findings said something like airplane takes off, does a low level in Wales, gets shot. <laughs> hunt party, you know, hunt party was at the exact same time. Uh, you know, a mallard duck, you know, impacted the, the plane. Widow reacts by throwing up his hand, accidentally resets the handle, makes a single, single ejection seat ejection. And the pilot lands and saves the plane. Okay, causes? Well, the causes was the hunt, right? The causes of the plane was the hunt. A recommendation, actually, a recommendation. Why are we flying low levels over these special ranches where they're releasing quail, releasing mallards? That's not the only, you know. Why are we doing that? Because it's because uh, it seems like an enemy part. You'd never thought about it. Nobody ever thought about it. I mean, we've been flying there since World War II, and this has never happened. So now, right now, when you fly over there, these hunt clubs, and there's a particular English name that I'm, I'm not remembering, these particular hunt clubs are designated. They're right there on the maps. So you don't fly near them. There's no way of knowing if they're doing it in the morning or the afternoon or when they're doing it. Whoops. That's but, uh, it is uh, now sort of makes sense that you're not going to fly all these hunt clubs when they're going to be releasing fowl that can go up to uh, 500 feet and, and run into your plane, right? So uh, that was the recommendations of it. All right, questions. Hmm. Hmm. That's comical. Comical. How do you fix the plane and get it home? So we some duck <laughs> well, no, the planes are a long way from home. I mean, these are uh, England does not have interstates as as much as we do. What you have to do, yes. Do you have to like put give it to a repair people to put another seat in another canopy? In That's exactly right. You actually deploy six maintenance people over there for two weeks, not two weeks, but something like to clean it up, take out the ejection seat, put in another ejection seat. Got to put in a canopy, otherwise he's flying. He was huddled behind his HUD, his heads up display, which is like this big, and he was huddled behind that. But I mean, it was really tough landing. He did, he did a very good job landing. He did a great job. He deserved his award that he got that year as the top uh, emergency, the top, uh, he got what's called the Collegian Award, which is the, the highest Air Force Safety Award that year. What other, what other considerations? Would you believe that somebody actually shot down a plane? No. Yes, sir. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> but then once I got the figure, once I figured out that these guys having guns and shooting ducks are very unusual, so to speak. It's not what we think. I had to get over my American idea of why didn't you have guns? Why weren't you shooting all these? Well, you don't exactly do that in other countries. You know, when you go investigate this stuff, you may have different ideas about what goes on. On my investigation board, of course, I, what kind of members would I have? You might might be investigating, yeah, talking to the, the flyers of England that, that know about hunt clubs, right? I go and talk to them. Yeah. Who else would you have? Maintenance? What did you say? Metal experts. Metal experts. That's exactly what we had to do. We actually sent off the the uh, handle to have it investigated to see if you could see that it had the imprint of the glove or his hand. Right? Bird experts. Excuse me? Bird experts. Bird experts. Believe it or not, we sent away the feathers that were, maybe I, I you know, probably, may, you know, uh, feathers to this one person at the Smithsonian Institute who can identify any bird in the world. And she came back and goes, I got great news for you. It's a duck. <laughs> it's a mallard duck. Is it a mallard duck or a mallard duck? Mallard. And, so, uh, and so she knew all about that. 
But uh, that was something you did think about. And actually, see, that didn't happen in 30 days. I had to get my answers in 30 days, right, for the uh, report that came back a year later or something like that. Okay. All right. What else? What other kind of questions for an investigation? So when you guys, on Monday, a week from Monday, you're going to actually be taught a lot of this stuff, but then you're actually going to be assigned a plane afterwards. You're going to come up, try to figure out why it happened, findings, how it happened, why it happened, and what can you do to stop it from happening again. All right. Any other questions? Groups when we do that? Or? Yes. You're going to have groups of, uh, you've already formed your groups, actually. Remember? All right. Thank you very much.